in 1931. After winning the bloody Castelmarese War between Salvatore Maranzano and Joe the Boss Mazzaria, Maranzano called a meeting of crime bosses in Wappingers Fall, New York, to declare himself Capo di Tutti Capi, boss of all bosses. Maranzano then whittled down the rival family's rackets in favor of his own. Luciano appeared to accept these changes, but was merely biding his time before deposing Maranzano. Maranzano's scheming, his arrogant treatment of his subordinates, and his fondness for comparing his organization to the Roman Empire did not sit well with Luciano and his allies. Despite his advocacy for modern methods of organization, including crews of soldiers doing the bulk of a family's illegal work under the supervision of a capo regime. At heart, Maranzano was a mustache Pete, an old school mafioso too steeped in old world ways. He was opposed to Luciano's partnership with Jewish gangsters such as Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. In September of 1931, in response to Maranzano's ascension, plans were being made for his assassination. Maranzano's death marked the end of an old world run era in mafia history and ushered in a new, more organized era of organized crime. Unlike Maranzano, Luciano had no aspirations of becoming boss of all bosses. At the same time, he wanted to avoid the chaos that led to blood wars and carnage in New York and Chicago during the 1920s. Luciano and Meyer Lansky realized the best solution was to allow each family to self-govern, but establish a central organization for settling conflict without bloodshed. This would preserve family control, prevent warfare, promote their business interests, and minimize scrutiny from the public and law enforcement. Much like a corporation, Luciano established a mob board of directors to oversee all mafia activities in the US and serve to mediate conflicts between families. The Commission, the governing body of the Italian American Mafia. Luciano assumed the position of chairman. Lansky served as his chief advisor. The commission was comprised of seven family bosses. Charles Lucky Luciano, Joseph Bonanno, Giuseppe Joe Profacci, Vincent the Executioner Mangano, Tommaso Tommy Gagliano, Chicago Outfit Boss Alphonse Scarface Capone, and Buffalo's family boss, Stefano the Undertaker Magadino. The commission held the power of approving a new boss before he could officially become boss. The New York Five families also decided that the names of all new proposed members must be approved by the other families. After the new proposed member was approved by the other families, he could become a made man. The commission allowed Jewish mobsters, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Louis Lepke Buckhalter, Dutch Schultz, and Abner Longhees Wilman to work alongside them and participate in some meetings. The commission would meet every five years or when needed to discuss family dynamics. This structure provided a backbone for organized crime in America and strengthened the power of the five families by awarding them permanent seats on the board. The members of the commission knew the intricacies of the underworld in which they lived and died in. One simply cannot manage an organization where violence and death run rampant without some form of enforcement. The combination was formed. 
later dubbed Murder Incorporated by the media. Murder Inc. The execution branch of the National Crime Syndicate created to avoid the bloody gang wars of the 1920s. Creating an organization with the power to mediate organized crime disputes and punish its offenders, mafia style. Murder Incorporated was largely headed by mob boss Louis Lepke Buckalter and Mangano family underboss Albert the Mad Hatter Anastasia. Also included were members from Buckalter's labor slugging gang in partnership with Tommy Three Fingered Brown Lucchese. In addition, there were members of a street gang based out of the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, led by Abe Kit Twist Rellis and Martin Bugsy Goldstein. Buckalter in particular, and Joe Adonis, occasionally gave the outfit its orders from the board of directors of the syndicate. Anastasia was the trope's operating head, assisted by Lepke's longtime associate, Jacob Gara Shapiro. Unlike the five families, which required members to be of Sicilian or Southern Italian ancestry, Murder Inc. was a diverse ethnic gang that included Jews, Italians, and members of other ethnic groups from poor and working class neighborhoods, such as Brownsville, Brooklyn, and Manhattan's Lower East Side. Those selected to carry out high profile murders were the best in the business, dispatched to various cities and towns throughout the United States. Ice picks, ropes, guns, hatchets, and bare hands were all employed by the men to do the job. Sometimes they worked in small teams. Other times they worked solo, but they were extremely well organized, disciplined, efficient, and meticulous in their planning. As Costa Nostra's business interests expanded, membership to Murder Inc. swelled. At its height, the syndicate had over 250 contract killers on payroll, all involved in murder, bootlegging, narcotic smuggling, gambling, extortion, labor racketeering, and other rackets. It was the most brutal collection of bloodthirsty characters ever produced by organized crime in America. Murder Inc.'s inception, its activities, and its inner workings shocked 1930s society and made newspaper sales soar with sensational headlines and salacious details of underworld death dealing and deceit. Abe Kid Twist Rellis, born Abraham Rellis, the son of Austrian Jewish immigrants, Rellis stole his nickname of Kid Twist from New York gangster Max Kid Twist Swerback, leader of Monk Eastman Gang in the early 1900s. Rellis's small stature did not deter him from committing ruthless acts of violence. In fact, he became known as a particularly cold blooded deviant. When carrying out murders, his weapon of choice was an ice pick. Rellis became so adept at using the ice pick, many of his murder victims were thought to have died of a cerebral hemorrhage. During Prohibition, while still teenagers, Rellis and fellow Murder Inc. hitman Martin Bugsy Goldstein went to work for the Shapiro brothers, who ran the Brooklyn Rockets. Soon Rellis and Goldstein were committing petty crimes for the brothers. On one such occasion, Rellis was caught and sentenced to two years at an upstate New York juvenile facility. 
the Shapiro brothers failed to help Rellis, thereby sowing seeds of revenge. Rellis, Goldstein, and future Murder Inc. hitman Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss were partners in all of their criminal activities, which had primarily been the slot machine business and quickly expanded to include loan sharking, crap games, and labor slugging in connection with union activities. The slot machine business thrived and soon Rellis and Goldstein were on the Shapiro's hit list. One night, the two men received a phone call from a friend tipping them off that the Shapiro brothers had left their East New York headquarters. Hopping into a car with fellow gangster George DeFeo, they headed to East New York. However, when they arrived at the Shapiro's building, the three men were ambushed. Rellis and Goldstein were wounded, but all three men managed to escape. Martin Bugsy Goldstein, born Meyer Goldstein. Martin grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, alongside future Murder Inc. hitman, Abe Kid Twist Rellis. At the age of 12, both boys dropped out of school and took part-time jobs. Goldstein worked for a plumber, Rellis an engraver. But their real vocation was crime. Goldstein and Rellis became a two-man crime spree, robbing, stealing, murdering, all while working under the Shapiro brothers. Once the two men ventured out on their own rackets, they became marked men. During the ambush attempt spearheaded by the Shapiro brothers, both Rellis and Goldstein were shot. Goldstein had the tip of his nose blown off. After the men recovered from their injuries, they sought revenge. Future Murder Inc. hitman Harry Happy Mayone and Frank the Dasher Abendondo were recruited into their crew to wipe out all three Shapiro brothers. As Murder Inc. blossomed, it rapidly became apparent that their main skill set was in expertly plotted assassinations. Throughout the 1930s, the men embarked on an estimated 1,000 murders, a frightening number of executions nationwide, all while avoiding any serious convictions. Coincidentally, just like fellow mobster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Goldstein was given the nickname Bugsy because he was considered a bit crazy. Harry Happy Mayone was a temperamental and undeniably menacing contract killer. He led the Ocean Hill Hooligans, an Italian street gang in the Ocean Hill, Brooklyn section of New York. Mayone moved in the same violent circles as some of the most deadly mobsters to join Murder, Inc. In fact, his protege was fellow hitman Frank the Dasher Abendondo. In 1931, Mayone and Abendondo helped Abe Kid Twist Rellis and Martin Bugsy Goldstein eliminate their gangster rivals, the Shapiro brothers, William, Meyer, and Irving. Previously that year, the Shapiros had unsuccessfully tried to murder Rellis and Goldstein. Meyer Shapiro abducted Rellis's girlfriend, dragged her to an open field where he beat and raped her. To avenge the ambush and his girlfriend's rape, Rellis enlisted the help of fellow Murder Inc. killers, Abendondo and Mayone. The two killers were glad to help. They hoped to kill the Shapiro brothers and take over some of their rackets. After several futile attempts by each side to eradicate the other, Murder Inc. finally caught up with Irving Shapiro. On July 11th, 1931, Irving Shapiro was gunned down near his apartment. 
Relis dragged him from the hallway of his home, out into the street, where he was beaten by all four men and shot dead. Two months later, on September 17th, Relis met Maya Shapiro and killed him, shooting him in the face. Another three years would pass before Relis finally got the last Shapiro brother. William Shapiro was abducted and taken to the gang's hideout. Once there, he was beaten nearly to death, stuffed into a sack, and driven out to the Canarsie section of Brooklyn where he was buried. Before the gang could finish burying William, a passerby spotted them and they had to flee the scene. William Shapiro's body was exhumed shortly thereafter and after being autopsied, it was determined he had been buried alive. The nickname Happy was little more than a tongue-in-cheek moniker. Harry Happy Mayone only smirked, snarled, or scowled. His name and criminal reputation grew to infamous proportions upon news of his affiliation with Murder, Inc. Between 1924 and 1940, Mayone had been arrested 32 times, an astonishing arrest record, considering he received only four minor convictions prior to his execution in 1942. Frank the Dasher Abandondo began as a teenager, extorting money from shop owners by threatening to torch their shops. By his 20s, he had joined a street gang in the Ocean Hill section of Brooklyn where he quickly became a lieutenant of Harry Happy Mayone. Abandondo organized gambling, loan sharking, and extortion rackets for the gang, as well as committing murders. During the 1920s and 30s, Abandondo was reputed to have killed 30 people. His preferred killing method was to stab his victims through the heart with an ice pick. In 1937, Abandondo assisted in the murder of George Rudnick, a loan shark in Brooklyn. Relis had ordered Rudnick's murder because he had received information that Rudnick was a police informant. Using an ice pick and a meat cleaver, Abandondo and several other gang members strangled Rudnick before stabbing him 63 times. Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss, born Harry Strauss. He adopted the name of Pittsburgh Phil, although he had never been to the Smoky City. The Brooklyn bred thug became so popular that when an out of town crime family needed an outsider for a contract kill, they almost always requested Phil. He packed his briefcase with a shirt, a change of socks, undergarment, a gun, a knife, a length of rope, and an ice pick. Hopped a train or plane to his destination, pulled the job, and caught the next connection back to New York. Oftentimes, Phil did not even know the name of the individual he had been dispatched to kill, and generally, he didn't care to find out. He reportedly killed over 100 men, though some historians put the number as high as 500, using a variety of methods, including shooting, stabbing with ice picks, drowning, live burial, and strangulation. In the 1930s, he was committing assaults, larcenies, drug dealing, he was arrested 18 times, but was never convicted until he was found guilty of the homicide that sent both he and fellow Murder Inc. hitman, Martin Bugsy Goldstein, to the electric chair. In 